Okay, so again, welcome everyone to Paper Club. Uh, today, Arvid, who is uh, one of our regular attendees, is going to be talking about uh, transformers applied to time series. So it is a good, uh, uh, I think it's a good way to end our series on transformers, which we've been talking about for the better part of two months now. Uh, and again, speaking about transformers in a different context, uh, which is time series forecasting. So Arvid, please go ahead. Thank you for having me. Uh, this particular paper I got from the other journal club, that is the Evening Journal Club, and they discussed it there, and I quite liked it, even though I'm usually not a fan of these heavy engineering papers. This one was sufficiently straightforward that, that it was, was nice to go through. Um, as, as Carla said, it's, it's about time series forecasting using uh, self-attention, and, and why it is a good idea to do so. And so what, what's the, uh, sorry. So what, what's actually the, the, the problem people try to solve? Um, forecasting is generally hard, especially when it's about the future. So this is a problem many people have, have tried their hands on. And in this particular case, we're looking at uh, multiple step forecasts, so not just one step ahead, but we also want to be able to forecast at different points into the future. Um, many of the traditional methods like SHAP or, or LIME lack the, or are not, not directly applicable to time series analysis. So that makes them makes most times these analysis so far less explainable. So this is a problem because, of course, when you, when you build a hedge fund that, that uses these, um, it's, it's good to know why certain decisions are being made or why certain predictions uh, start happening. Um, there's also the, the, the problem that is somewhat hard to, to, to handle, that you have often known and unknown inputs, meaning that if we, we talk about future, you know for example, that one week from now is another Thursday. So for certain analyses, that is important, but you don't know exactly what sort of weather is going to be. So you, you definitely want to have both a set of variables, known and unknown inputs into your data set, but you, um, there, there's no well-defined way of doing that a priori. And um, yes, the uh, explainability, as I said, often doesn't work too well on um, uh, uh, time ordered uh, problems, it's the same point, but forecasts are very important, right? So if you look at all the political uh, forecasts in the last months or so, that those, those things are of, of huge value for, for pretty much any company. Now here, they, they first define the, the, the model itself, what is the model? So we do have um, observed inputs and known inputs, and the observed inputs are essentially cut off after the, the prediction point, which is now the forecasting time. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to predict into the future values, but rather than predicting the value itself, we predict the quantiles. So what is the median value? What is the uh, 90% quantile and the 10% quantile? And we also have static covariates. Basically our model runs on, on particular instances or entities as they're called. And each entity also has their own uh, um, yeah, data that should also go into that. What, what could be an entity, for example, think about predicting a, uh, for, for different store chains, what sort of products are being sold. So the entities could be the store chain or a store chain and um, product combination where, where each one is essentially you have information that, that is valid throughout your prediction period. Um, what, what is new in this particular paper? Well, they, they first of all talk about these uh, static encoders. So basically this the static information is always there um, that they, they feed it in at every step. That is something new. They use a gating mechanism that allows to start off with a fairly complex description of a model, but during training, the model has the, the freedom to relax to a simpler model, uh, which um, as you see is, is also helpful. There is a, sequence to sequence layer in the whole process that allows for um, small temporal uh, information to or, or, or local temporal information to pass through. So, so you have a very strong layer for, for local temporal uh, information. And then there's this attention mechanism that is temporal in nature, but has a longer look back. So, so you can combine short range and long range look backs in, in the same, uh, yeah, mechanism for prediction. 
And but, 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 uh, what do we need? Explainability. Well, we, first of all, we see which variables are actually important globally. So these are mostly the static ones. We are interested whether there are any temporal patterns when that we can we can single out that essentially uh, are are uh, yeah observed by by the machine that is being trained. And we are also interested in what are the special events in our time series that we should pay attention to. Um, so there's a sort of outlier detection in there that, that, that tells us here we have to pay attention something unusual is happening. Um, how, how does the, the, the mathematical formulation look like? Look like? So, so we have these, these I unique entities that could be the stores. And for each of them, we have information about time steps. We have the static covariates, which are then for each entity, the, the, the constant ones that, that don't change with time. They are just like store size and, and stuff like that, that that are always the same. We have temporal information that is also dependent on the entity, but um, could change throughout. So that could, for example, be your, your sales numbers. These numbers are uh, subdivided into two. One is the ones that we are known, uh, that, that, that are known, and one is the ones that are unknown, and they are concatenated. I, I think for the future they are just set to zero or, or something. Or, um, but um, it's, it's not not particularly important because we're going to see that our model is essentially combine, uh, combines two two predictors: one for the past, one for the future, and they only get later combined or fusioned. And we have the targets, which are real numbers in, in all cases. Even, even though in, in one of the data sets we're going to see later, the targets are, um, are bound. But that is no, no problem for this model. What are we trying to do? We, we're trying to put the, uh, forecast the quantiles. And this, this equation sort of sums up exactly what we're trying to do. So we're trying to predict the quantile for the, for the target on the ice, um, ice entity. Uh, some tau time steps ahead. So, so we, uh, tau is also a variable, so we can we can predict at different time steps forward and backward. And we have here our uh, static covariates. We have the different, actually, put it down here. We have the different known and unknown observables, and we see that the look back on these is different. So the the known the the known observables that we only can observe at the time only go up to the current time, but the known unknowns, no, wrong, that is not known unknowns, but the, the ones we do know from the future, we do actually see in our inputs as well. So, so we do have up to the prediction time tau what these are going to be. And yeah, that's the model. So it, it, it looks very relatively complex and it is a fairly complicated beast, but it, it com consists of many different small uh, modules. And the important thing to notice here that there are many things that share the same color and pretty much anything that shares the same color here has the same uh, weights. So there, there, there's massive weights sharing across the whole thing. And we're gonna go now, I think, to the individual steps to see what they're exactly doing, All right? So the, the first thing is that we have a, right. yeah. Uh, so I have a question. So um, so uh, what, what are the quantile? Uh, so they computed on which, on what? Uh, because all the input will be different, right? So, so um, then obviously they're not going to compute the quantum on everything. But I was wondering uh, the you you, you ask how, how can you how can you put a target as a quantum? That, that's, that's actually a good question. We're gonna come to it a little bit later. It, it uses a special um, loss. This is quite smart actually. That this the loss enforces. The model to train an actual quantile, which is which is pretty neat. Um, yeah, just just wait a little. And then uh, I, I was wondering if for for like uh, so the because so the the, the quantile over which distribution of, of I mean um, ideally the underlying distribution at that prediction point. So so you have a that comes back to to our Bayesian um, uh, talks we had, we had much much earlier. Essentially, at each point in time, given all the information you have, the problem is not deterministic, right? So you always, at each point in time, would predict actually a distribution. And it's of this distribution that you predict the quantiles. Um, you're absolutely right that each individual time set, you only observe one. 
but ideally your, your forecasts are not a single number, but, but rather a range of numbers. Okay, okay. thank you. Right. Um, yes, so the, the first step is the static variable encoder. That is the more or less your traditional data frame where, where each row is, your, is, is something that tells you something about the entity you're looking for, for example, the stores. And they are encoded and they are essentially put into everything else. So, so any, any other component you have there pretty much takes these static encoders, coded information into account. And when we say encoding, um, I probably didn't mention it here, but all the encoding shares the same depth. So, so we have the model, which is the, the, or the dimension. So everything beyond the, the starting point gets merged into this dimension. So, so this is like a fundamental number, which is, which is, which is shared throughout the model, namely the, the depth of the encoding. For example, here we have these, the skating mechanism, which is also used everywhere in the whole network, which essentially takes an input, already offsize the model, and it has this residual connection and um, you know, a more or less standard ga uh, gate where we have uh, some nonlinear transformation, some ELO activation, which is, I think, also quite common by now, with some dropout attached to it and some gating. And essentially, this is nice because this nonlinearity is essentially optional, right? So, so it can be the, the model can learn that this, this processing is not necessary. So the, the information could, in principle, go straight through. And that is the, the, the basic yeah, piece that, that gives you this, this adaptive complexity that, that, you, that you, the model can dumb down as much as it wants, uh, which is really, really useful. And like I said, this is used all over the place. Uh, and it's up uh, GRN. Every time you see GRN, it's actually this. For example, here, this is the, the second part. It's a variable selection network. So you start with your very basic inputs. The, the time series x and and, and and or chi and they are first transformed into your d-dimensional uh, inputs here these these are your they, they are essentially also learned but there is not very much information put in there I think it's we really just take take a variable and put it into one d-dimensional encoding and then again you process this with these grn units which either work or they don't uh, for each input feature. So you get transformed ones, which are potentially already nonlinearly messed with. And you also have another gating mechanism that essentially sums these up. Here's actually a tilde missing. And what it does is it selects of your, of your MX or MKI input features, which ones are important. And this is essentially trained, right? And this is quite useful because you already can see from the these numbers that are, that are trained here, which variables are important? If there are some variables that are never being 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 passed on to the to the past the first uh, initial uh, or initial step, you know that this variable can't possibly be important for for any predictions that are being made. So they claim that it's also novelties, though, though I'm pretty sure previous things like that have already existed in other papers. Um, yes, so inputs are transformed to the model dimensions. So to have everything in the same line. And continuous variables are linearly encoded, whereas you just have the standard embedding for categorical, cate categoricals. Yeah, uh, nonlinear processing, again, is, is only optional, so, so that the model doesn't have to become super complex at that point. And it's, it's interesting to, to look on. Also, it's good at, at silencing noisy variables early on, which, which typically helps in, in predictive uh, quantities. Then the next step, so, so we have now our variables encoded into a d-dimensional encoding. We already filtered the not so important ones out. Now we come to the local encoding. That is your more or less traditional LSTM. But here we have two LSTMs. The, the first part, they, they share uh, a set of weights. The second one share a set of weights. And other than that, it's, it's a normal LSTM. It goes through and the, the, the state is passed through and we, have just another encoding, except that this time, the any part of in the future has gotten a little bit of information from the back passed on. So, so this way, you can already see some temporal uh, local features that, that could be created here. And again, are being gated and added 
while you also still have residual connections. As I said at the beginning, at every point, static information is still fed in so that, for example, the size of the store could already be taken into account for in these encoders. And Sorry, Arvid, I have a question. Please. Yeah, uh, so I think it's related to what probably what you are about to say. Why do the why do we have two sets of LSTMs and not a single set? Ah, good question. Well, here the the input um, only contains the known inputs, right? The the unknown inputs, uh, the the unknown inputs that are known in, in hindsight fit, fit into here. Here's our, our forecasting time step. And this is the, the input we know already about the future. So, so like, like the day of the week or so, that is something we, we definitely know. And so here, there's still a clear step between the, the, the quality of, of variables from the past into the future. I, I think that that's the only reason that this. Okay. Works. And I see a connection between uh, uh, T and T plus one in the LSTM. So they mean that yeah. the the two sets of LSTMs have to share the dimension of the yes. that connection, right? Yes, it's correct. That's correct. And, okay. Um, actually, I, I don't know. Is the LSTM internal dimension completely specified by the input and output dimension? Probably not, right? Um, uh, that's something I, I probably should know or either look up. But um, the the important thing to know is that the input and output dimensions are the same. It's still our D-model dim dimensional um, encoding. Mm -hmm. and, okay, thank you. But yeah, you, you're right. If they, they, they probably have some sort of enforcement here that they share the same internal dimension. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to pass mm -hmm. on the state, right? Yeah. Good, good, very good question. And so now we have a a sequence of encodings that go from minus k to tau max. And that essentially becomes your sentence as for, or what, what would be a sentence in your traditional uh, attention network systems, right? And at this point, it's, it's just a sentence that there is, there is model-wise not, not a distinction anymore between uh, future and past. So here we still have this, this clear separation beyond that point that that goes away. I think at that point we get our, our classical attention. So attention we, we know by now pretty well is essentially you, you you create a value and that value is value is modulated by some normalized attention. This normalized attention works on some encoded features. And so so every time you have an encoding, you have an encoding dimension, and this time this introduces the, the attention dimension. Which is essentially also another uh, hyperparameter of your of your model to fix. And here they also do it per per head, so we have several heads. Actually, the, the these are not quite compatible, right? So here you have no uh, W layers. Here you suddenly have them. I'm, I'm I'm not sure how it is defined, but but in one way or another, it, it it's going to be incorporated in there. And the 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 attentions are essentially concatenated. In, 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 normally, they, they are concatenated. Um, here, they actually decided not to do that. They took their attention heads and combined them. And the, the, of course, the inputs, they, they put all the dimensions to be the same, which is our, our input dimension, the model. The, the attention dimension is also shared. Why is that good? They claim it helps uh, explainability or interpretability because now you have only one attention matrix, so it becomes more interpretable. That I didn't quite understand because each individual head would also be interpretable or, or not more or less interpret interpretable than this. But as we also discussed in past papers, I, I don't even know why these attention heads would learn something different. So if they are all messed into the same, um, into the same, um, yeah, aggregation. They, 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 there doesn't seem to be much incentive for these to do, learn something different because they essentially would just cancel each other out. So I, I would still think it's more like an ensembling step at this point. Yeah, but I think that if you have a single, because uh, so so those W matrix they are uh, dimensionality reduction basically or expansion if you want to, but so they basically convert your inputs into the model dimension. 
but if you have multiple attention heads, each of the values is going to be transformed in a different way. Yeah. So it's hard to, to say, I guess it would be hard to say why in one head, uh, a value, like a, a particular entry of the value gets, uh, uh, gets overweight yep. and then in another one gets underweight and then another one gets something medium or something like that. Whereas if you have a single value, because it's self-attention, right? So you're basically, your values are your inputs as well. Yeah. So your attention mask, which is the average of all the heads, you, you get just one attention mask, right? Uh, is directly telling you how much you should pay attention to your inputs. Uh, yes. And there is just one. Yes. I guess that and makes it more interpretable. Because there's only one, yes. But first of all, I, I would still say that if you have N of these masks, or M, MH of these masks, each one would actually be also interpretable and might be interesting, right? So it would be interesting to see does one particular head has like a different look back than another. As, as we saw for these convolutional kernels, the different heads were indeed learning different kernel kernels that each of them captures something different about the problem. Here, that is not quite clear. And especially after, after combining all of that, that information I would think would get lost. Um, I, yeah. I don't know, this is something one would have to actually test. I would think that the interpretability problem comes because then you have to combine all the heads as well. So you, you not only have the problem that each head is paying attention to a different thing, but also the, the, the resulting attention is also being combined in a way. So you have an extra set of weights that you have to interpret. Yeah, um, I suppose so. So you, you're just eliminating that concatenation and uh, remapping into the model dimension that you yeah. get in transformers. But in in the oh in the in the multi head uh, in the multi head attention do they actually do an attention for each or do they do they do they just combine them and, and make one big attention matrix out of these I I would have thought for each head you have a separate attention which afterwards is not normalized anymore Yeah you have one attention for each but then so that multi head uh, term, you have that WH at the end. Mm -hmm. So you concatenate and then WH, WH. We, we, we weight them. Uh, yeah. So mm -hmm. I would think that introduces another layer of that, that, that makes interpretability yeah. harder. Like you said, it's not impo I don't think it's impossible, but you, yeah. you have to account for that step as well. Like you can't just say, oh yeah, this head is paying attention to this particular feature. But then you yeah. have also have to see what happens when it's concatenated and reweighted. Yeah, that, that, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yes, and then here in this particular case, it is obviously self attention. So you have your, your sentence that was formed from your encoded features. And they used a masked form of it, where essentially they only look back in time. So, so they, for the attention mechanism, they did mask that the attention only can yeah, look, look in the past. Which is a bit odd, I think, because um, oh, first of all, we have this, this uh, dimensionality uh, fixing, which is a choice. But this decoder masking is, is is strange, I would say, because you know that already the information you 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 feed into the model is only information you actually have at the point in time of of your of your prediction. So so I I don't see why there's a particular need for that. To, to to have this additional masking, and I think when, when once you look at the, the plots that they are producing, I'm not even sure they, they consistently apply it because it definitely looks like they, they have attention that is also going forward in, in the steps. But I, I might have mis misunderstood that completely. That could as well be. Yes, and then of course you then you just make the, the last prediction, which is done on this encoding on the future encodings that goes to these attention mechanisms. And again, it's, it's shared, shared weights, and each one predicts the different quantiles. So, so the different quantiles are the different outputs. Um, was there anything about? So, so they, they chose the 10%, 50%, and 90% quantile, and they, they only forecast on the future. That's also then how, how they train only on the future forecasts. How does the loss look like? That is actually fairly interesting. They use quantile loss because if you think about your data, you don't know what the actual quantiles were at that point in time. But if you use such a loss, it's essentially Q times 
every time the actual value is larger than your prediction, plus one minus Q times the time when, when your actual value is smaller than your prediction. If you minimize this for your prediction, you actually get that it's the, the, the Q's quantile. And that's not, not entirely obvious that that is true, but one way to see this is if you put in Q equals one half, essentially what you get is the mean absolute error if you, if you apply this over your data set. And we know that the mean absolute error is minimized by the median, which would be the 50 quantile. So that works out and, and you can do the math and you can see that actually using this loss will also work for the other quantiles as well, which, which I found quite cool. And they, they tested that loss. They used it, I think, only on Q0.5 and 0.9 because they tried to compare it against historical uh, uh, or predictions from other, other papers. And I think that was the reason why, why they did it like this, because for others, they didn't have those predictions. And yeah, then they let's talk about the data sets themselves. So they have four data sets. Electricity and traffic are mostly used for benchmarking. One is the what is it, like one week of customer data for you from each hour to predict the the electricity use in the next 24 hours. So we have 24 forward-looking steps. The other one is to calculate the occupancy rate of freeways, which is slightly different because there you predict a number between zero and one because it's, it's a percentage. Um, I don't remember whether there was any specific change in the output that they made to, to account for that or whether in principle you could have predictions larger than one there. And then they introduced two other data sets. One is a retail data set of some store that has many products and trying to predict what is the, uh, how much of a, of a particular product is being sold in the next 30 days given we have 90 days of information about that uh, particular product and uh, you know the other, other information about that. And this is, of course, a, a much more complicated problem. There, there, are, there are many different variables involved, but it's also hugely uh, important economically because, because many companies are exactly trying to do that because if you know how much you, you are likely going to sell in the next um, 30 days plus minus some, some, some boundaries, you can plan ahead by, by how much of your products so you need to stock so you reduce waste and, and so that, that can be massively uh, valuable. The last data set is also very interesting. It's uh, a volatility forecasting of a, an index. So, so they have stocks that are based on, um, or that, that essentially capture how volatile other stocks are, I think. And of course, these stocks are being traded and, and the, it's, it's very valuable to, to, to predict those. And they have the data set for that. It's a fairly small data set because I think it's only 31 stocks. And then for, for one year of information using a five-day forecast. And yeah, it's, it's different from the other because it's small and noisy. So they train those. They do it three-way split, training, validation, and test. Um, and they searched hyperparameters randomly. So they have a, a hyperparameter space that mostly consists of the, the model depth or the, the encoding depth that is shared throughout the model. What is the dropout rate, the mini batch size, the, the learning rate, the, the, the clip the gradients, I think, and the number of heads that they, they are used at the, uh, at the attention step. And they, they say that on a single GPU, the electricity sets, so one of the benchmark sets took about six hours to train. So, so I think it was a fairly, fairly okay in terms of, of, um, of training effort compared to some of the other models we had that were trained on TPUs for, for a long time. Uh, can I ask, maybe I, I missed it. Do they also uh, take the, the sequence length as a hyperparameter? So how, how far back? I don't think so. The, the, I, th and I think the reason for that is that the, especially the, the benchmark sets are exactly that benchmarks. And, and so, you're, you're sort of bound to the to the size given there. Of course, you would think that lo longer lookbacks often can help, and I and I suspect there's one of the the training some uh, tests or one of the sets where probably a longer lookback would have been better, which we see somewhat glanced over, but uh, we're going to see that. Um, interesting enough, the the, the hyperparameters that have been chosen vary wildly from model to model. Uh, it's just because they are very, very different problems. So, so that's probably what you would expect. So there is 
all you can take from here is that there's probably no good default setting. So you always sort of have to uh, hyperparameter tune in order to find decent, de decent values. Let's see some results. So this is for our for benchmarks. And they, they are combined, uh, compared against many of the traditional uh, networks. So ARIMA is like classical time series analysis and uh, other sequence to sequence models. And you see that pretty much against every set, they, they, they win out. So they, they have better performance and, and not just one or 2% in terms of loss, but, but significantly more. Um, I'm not, I don't know enough about the other sets to know whether they were trained for the same loss. So sometimes those things can make a difference if your model trains on a different loss that then of course it optimizes that loss, but maybe other models have been trained for different loss. So not 100% not sure how comparable they are, but still it looks at least very, very impressive. And the same also for the more difficult data sets for the, this is the P15, P90 loss on the, on the uh, product data set. And you see again, it's, it's beating them beating it every time, also by a couple of percentages, and that would be directly economic benefit if you, if you have that. Um, they did an ablation study. What features are more important than others? You see the, the most important was, I think, the, the, the local processing, where you, where you have the, the non-linearities. The, the non so if they take that out, then in the most cases, your model gets worse, except I think it was the electricity one, actually got better probably because the, the data problem there is relatively easy so that any additional steps would, would have made it worse and actually reduced the, the predictability and uh, self-attention comes come second though and again here you see that especially for electricity the, this longer look back rather than just having your local look back but also your longer term look back makes makes a big difference uh, compared to some others and the same is then they also compared how the different, like the, the maximum error, how does the maximum error change when you take it out? And so the maximum error goes up for 30% if you take out the, the local processing or so. So yeah, it's it's quite interesting to see. Then the probably the, the, the gist of the paper was this interpretability. How what can we get out of the uh, paper by, by looking at the attention patterns? So first we started with the variable selection. The variable selection already tells us which, which variables are important. And when you look at the results from the data set, you probably get confirmed in your suspicions that yes, if you, if you have your sales data, then whether a national holiday is coming up or not is making a difference. So you would, you would think that these, these variables are important as they are indeed, and also, you know, past sales, right? If, if you have a product that has been selling well in the past, you would expect it to sell well in the future. And this is essentially where, where classic methods like, like Arima or so would, would fare fairly well. Um, yes, then they look at temporal patterns. Let's maybe zoom in a little bit. So here we have the one step ahead prediction. I think that was for the, for the electricity set, I wanna say. Um, and you see that every every output, so every quantile output works very, very similar, right? They always look back what exactly was the same value 24 hours ago. And then also compared still to the one two, uh, two days ago, three days ago and four days ago. So, so that's take a sort of weighted average over what has happened in the last, at this time of the day, in the last couple of days. And as you would expect, if you change your, your uh, forward-looking horizon, so if you try to predict five days ahead, it will most look what happened two days ago, because five days is seven days away from two days ago. So, uh, oh, no, hours, sorry, sorry, 24 hours. You know what I mean. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's essentially shifted. So, so, so all, the, all the forecasts essentially work the same, which is what you would expect, because they all share the same basis anyways. So this was for electricity and traffic was similar, except that here that the interval was, it was also 24 hours and the different forecasts also were very, very similar. Then the next one, 
uh, that was the, the more complex data set. So here's, here's definitely a bit more interesting stuff going on. For the retail data set, we do have look back that goes seven days. So, so there you see much more of a weekly pattern in, in terms of what, what products are being sold. And you also see that there's a very strong dependence on, on how far back you go. So that the further back you go, the less important your the information is that it flows into it. What I found interesting is that you do have these prediction patterns into the future, which I think means that their that their temporal cutting off, they didn't actually do that. I, th I think that they did use future information, and it would make sense, especially for sales. You would expect knowing whether a holiday comes up is is going to be important. So that's also why I didn't quite understand why cutting off those those uh, values in the selection uh, in the attention selection would have been very very helpful. Now the other data set was the, the volatility. And because it's a very simple data set, or not yeah, very, very noisy data set, here the attention mechanism is, is they, they say is essentially flat. The attention uh, essentially becomes a, a, a complete smoother. I would, however, say that this is also not quite true. It's if, if you look closely, there there is a spike in attention very early on. And if, if you remember, this is 250 days ago, but these are 250 business days. So it's, it's, essentially exactly one business year ago. So you could think that, yes, um, if I want to predict volatility, the, the best I can do is probably look what happened one year ago exactly. So so it's not completely flat either. And yeah, and you, you see that different quantites have, have similar patterns, but but they are typically shifted against, against each other. Questions at this point? Then we would come to the identifying regimes. So that was also quite interesting. They tried to think, how can we recognize whether, whether something interesting is going on? So what they do here is they take a new attention ma uh, matrix, each point, so, so for, for, for a given forecasting period, look at how often a particular position has attention to it and, and average the attention over that uh, over all time. So you know that on average, 30% uh, of the attention lies on my five days ago uh, data. And then they use that as, as a benchmark to compare new situations where the attention will have shifted to see whether, whether this new situation is, is different from, from the past because the attention has shifted. What's good to know is that if we sum over all time, because the attention itself is normalized, these numbers are also normalized. If, if I sum over all the all the positions in the back. And so they use as a distance metric, something that works on uh, distributions, which I, I actually haven't seen before, but it's they, they use this as, as a distance is squared of one minus this Pater career coefficient. Um, that this works is you, you can see if, if, if the two uh, distributions are the same, you, you see that the PI and QI are the same. So it becomes the square root of a square. So it becomes just a sum over the distribution itself. And because the distributions are normalized, it becomes one. So you know that if P equals Q, it becomes zero. And the same as if they are completely different. So if one is zero and the other is not, it becomes uh, one. So it becomes uh, quite far away. And so they use this metric averaged, I think, over all the time intervals to compare the, the current distribution of attention versus the historic distribution of attention to have a distance measure that that varies at any point in time. So it's, it's time dependent, but it can tell you whether how abnormal a particular situation is. And it's interesting that at no point they actually use the actual observed data, right? So they, they purely decide whether when it, uh, situation is interesting based on the forecast of the model. Um, so, so they're not saying, oh yeah, this is that this data is different from what we have forecasted it, but actually just the forecast. So we would probably think that, that this, because it, it works on data that is only seen from the past, that is probably a lagging measure. And here's where they have plotted it out. This is the volatility uh, time series. And they look at different situations. So, so, so gray background means here the attention is different from, from the long-term average. Um, here's a an, an 
situation where it's it's not different, where the where the the volatility behaves as expected, and you see that the attention indeed is, is flat, as we saw earlier, that is the long-term average of our attention. However, here, this is around the financial crisis, the attention suddenly becomes more interesting. The attention has peaks at certain situations where apparently something has happened, where there was a regime change of sort. And so here, this distance to the, to the long-term averages is quite high. So it would see this as a special region. If you ever see the how the how the attention follows the the actual events, it is indeed shifted, right? So so we see that this peak follows roughly this this race for for, for quite a bit. So so it's it's still good for for hindsight evaluation, especially I would say this individual attention is quite interesting to see where what 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 sort of things a, a model puts particular um, emphasis on. Yeah. I think that's pretty much it. So, so we have an interesting model that does uh, contain sequence to sequence encoding and combines it with self attention and it is beating the other models. It is quite interpretable, though I'm also not quite sure how 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 deeply interpreted it actually is in, in, in some parts. Um, and the, the I think one of the novelties is, is that it's it's fairly easy to adjust its own complexity and it can it can reduce its complexity when the data demands it. So that, that is quite, quite interesting. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Arvid. Uh, we have a question from the chat, which is uh, how hard do you think it would be to reproduce these results? Um, I would say fairly straightforwardly. So, so I tried actually um, training it a little bit. It, it runs on, on the old, um, uh, on the old, uh, what's it called, TensorFlow. Uh, one, but but they, they have a GitHub repository. You can download it, and in principle, after setting up environment, and so you can just run it, and and it, it, it works. So so it is. It should be reproducible. Yes. Interesting. Um, when you say yeah, it works, so, so, it's, it's, oh, sorry, go ahead, Carlos. Oh, sorry. So I was I, I was wondering. Because Arvid, you 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 have a bit more experience in uh, in sort of financial markets and forecasting, uh, so if you can give us sort of a bit of a of a uh, let's say a view of how impactful these these architecture can be in the in, in these areas. I, I think it was at the at the uh, journal club where this originally was 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 mentioned. That there, there was a guy who who came purely because of the financial aspect of that paper. Who otherwise didn't have much of a machine learning background, and and he was quite excited about it because you can you know that if you can predict such things even slightly better, one percent, two percent better than your competitors, you have an advantage in the market that that can translate into millions and, and more. So so that is, I think, why why this model is going to get probably even more attention. I think it's still fairly recent of a model to have much impact, but I'm sure this will become sooner or later the, the standard. Or something else that, that it builds on top of that. Yeah. Thanks. I like that how they took like basic building blocks, LSTMs, so it's it's also farmers, etc. Yeah. It's 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 really more engineering, right? So, so you, they don't have, I think, anything that is massively new or so, but but it, it's it's well put together. And I think it's also quite important that you get a range of, of outcomes that right? you, you really quantify it's rather than just a single number, which is for many applications the, the, the more important. Okay. Are there any more questions or comments? Uh, nope. Okay. No. Well, thank you very much, Arvid, for this uh, great presentation. Um, mm -hmm. I think that if we can all show our appreciation by show of hands, uh, I don't know if you can see a show of hands, but I can't. So it's fine. Thank you, Armin. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. So this uh, uh, this concludes our series on transformers. So we'll try to get something uh, new for um, for next uh, week. Uh, do we have more sessions planned towards Christmas? Uh, we have to think about it. Uh, we will put it on the GitHub repo. We'll put uh, when uh, is the next session. Uh, cool. Okay. So thanks very much. As usual, if there is a particular 
paper or topic that you would like to present or that you would like to discuss, please do send us your uh, send us your suggestions and we'll be more than happy to uh, to accommodate them. Thanks again, Arvid, and see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Arvid. Thanks, Arvid. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.